of transformation is occurring faster than ever thanks to the modern breeding techniques. New hybrid or genetically engineered varieties can be produced within a couple of years. These crops have little to no variation among them in their genetic composition, which guarantees quality and quantity of their yield, as well as their resistance to multiple pathogen and environmental stresses for which they have been improved. A single purebred line with multiple genetic improvements can be cultivated across a vast range of environmental variation in different countries or even continents and on increasingly larger surfaces. Because of the uniformity of their agronomic traits, these crops are easy to cultivate using mechanization, which is saving a lot of time. However, the guarantee for a cost-effective, stable, high productivity in optimal conditions comes at a high price, the reduction of agrobiodiversity. Agrobiodiversity designates the biodiversity in agricultural systems. There are different levels of agrobiodiversity. Genetic diversity can be observed within a field, but also within a crop species. The next level of agrobiodiversity is the diversity of all crop species that are cultivated, whether in a specific field, at the level of a country, region, or even the whole world. The highest level of agrobiodiversity is at the ecosystem or landscape level, which englobes the different types of ecological communities and landscapes. All three levels of agrobiodiversity have undergone significant reductions since the development of modern breeding techniques and farming. Genetic or intraspecies and intravariety diversity has decreased ever since the first events of plant domestication as a consequence of mass selection. This is not surprising, since the goal of mass selection is to eliminate undesired genotypes and multiply the desired ones. Such selective pressure reduced the genetic diversity of early domesticated crops compared to the wild relatives. With the arrival of contemporary plant breeding and farming techniques, the reduction of genetic diversity was even more intensified as modern farming favors the cultivation and improvement of only a few select, pure breeding lines with no genetic diversity within the line. Modern farming and breeding not only decreases the genetic variability within crop varieties, they also decrease the overall number of varieties cultivated in the fields. At the beginning of the 20th century, an average of almost 400 varieties were available for most frequently grown fruits and vegetable crops. And by the 1980s, the average number of varieties per crop decreased tenfold. Finally, the diversity of all cultivated species in the world has significantly decreased. Among the 7,000 domesticated species, less than 200 are currently grown in agricultural fields. But these 200 species are not present in the field at the same frequency. About three quarters of the total agricultural production comes from only 12 crop species four of which are responsible for over half of the caloric and proteic input in the human population. The same reduction in number of cultivated species is observed on regional levels. This pie chart is showing the different crops that are cultivated in one Indian province, and you can see that over two-thirds of the crop production corresponds to only three staple crops – rice, corn and sugarcane. The landscape diversity has also been dramatically reduced since the mechanization of agriculture. From diverse fields, in which farmers were growing different types of crops interspaced with non-cultivated areas, the number of species grown per field has decreased, and non-cultivated areas have been also eliminated, resulting in modern-day monoculture fields. But why is the loss of agrobiodiversity so worrying? From a genetic point of view, diversity allows the populations to rapidly adapt to new, unforeseen environmental changes. Imagine a field in which a single purebred genotype is grown. All individuals are complete homozygotes and there is no genetic variation among them. 
If they are grown in the appropriate environmental conditions, each individual plant will have a good, high-quality production. But what happens if something in the environment changes? For instance, a new, never-before-seen pathogen, as the blight in the 19th century, is introduced in the field by mistake. Being all genetically identical, these crops have the same level of high sensitivity to the pathogen. So a single pathogen species introduced in the field can multiply and thrive on this huge, almost unlimited resource until all the plants are infested and destroyed. But modern plant breeding techniques allow to quickly create new, resistant crop varieties, especially through the use of genetic engineering. So the field can now be planted with a new, genetically uniform crop that is highly resistant to blight. But this new resistance will be completely useless if a different type of pathogen invades the field. The same story will be repeated again. If the crop population is genetically diverse, the outcome of pathogen introduction is completely different. Each plant in the field is slightly different than the others, and they will be differently affected by pathogens or other environmental changes. So when a new pathogen arrives, some plants will be destroyed by it, but others will survive. The overall productivity of the crop field is more variable from one year to the next, but on the long term, this variation is a small fee to pay for the guarantee that no major losses will occur for the farmer. Species and landscape diversity can have the same impact on preventing pathogen spreads. A large field sown with the same species can entirely succumb to a newly introduced pathogen because nothing limits the spread of this pathogen. Whereas if the field is divided in smaller plots, each with a different culture, the spread of the pathogen can be limited. If it is capable of infecting one species in one plot, but it is surrounded by other crop species not susceptible to the pathogen, the only way for the disease to spread to other fields would be if it was transported by the farming equipment. Such spreads can be easily avoided if the equipment is cleaned in between two uses. Furthermore, if the agricultural landscape also integrates non-cultivated wild plots, it can also benefit from ecosystem services provided by non-crop species. For instance, incorporating prairie patches in the field will attract pollinators that will then help with the crop pollination and thus increase their productivity. The consequences of reduced agrobiodiversity can be catastrophic as was the case with the Great Irish Famine. This unfortunate event is estimated to have caused the loss of one million people's lives in Ireland alone within the span of four years. As a comparison, my estimate of COVID-19 related deaths within the next four years should be about 1000 times lower. There are many social and political reasons that led to the Great Irish Famine. But from biological point of view, there are two culprits the phytophora infestans, a parasitic organism, and the Irish lumper, which was the potato variety grown almost exclusively in all Irish fields. Both of them were brought about by humans. Combined together, they result in potato blight, which can completely destroy the harvest of a crop. In the 19th century, almost all Irish farmers were growing the clonal variety of potato, the Irish lumper. Because of its clonal reproduction, there was no genetic diversity in potato fields. At the time, there were only two fungal diseases of potatoes, so the Irish lumper had no resistance to other types of pathogens, including phytophora infestans. In 1982, the parasite was introduced in Europe, likely by transporting infected potatoes from US to Ireland as food for passengers on clipper ships. Within a couple of years, the parasite rapidly spread in the country, destroying virtually all potato crops between 1845 and 1849. If the diversity of potatoes grown in the field would have been higher, despite not being specifically bred for resistance to blight, 
some of the genotypes might have been resistant to the disease and thus assure the sustainability of the crop. Another example about the devastating consequences of reduced agrobiodiversity is the invasion of Felipanchia ramosa in France. This holoparasitic plant attaches itself on the roots of a host plant and feeds on their sap until they literally suck the life out of them. On this image is an experimental plot with canola crops. The ones on the left have not been invaded by the parasite, whereas on the right you see what happens four months after invasion by Feripanchia ramosa. Literally nothing is left. The species has caused catastrophic damages in canola, hemp and tobacco production in France. It spreads rapidly and efficiently, partly because of the numerous small seeds it produces. They are less than a millimeter long and a single plant can produce over 200,000 seeds. But the other reason for the efficient spread of this parasite is the growth of its favorite host crops in vast monoculture fields which are the equivalent of an all-you-can-eat buffet for a very gluttonous plant. Plant breeders have been designing crops resistant to Felipanchia ramosa for many years now. However, this breeding program is an endless arms race. Every time a new, resistant variety of canola is bred, quickly after its massive introduction in the field, a new strain of Felipanchia ramosa evolves, capable of infesting this new variety. And the cycle continues on for many years. To sum it all up, there are three levels of agrobiodiversity – genetic, species and landscape diversity. The reduction of agrobiodiversity is caused since the beginning of agriculture with the domestication of plants, but it was recently intensified by the massive production of purebred lines and farming techniques such as growing monocultures and landscape unification. Reduced agrobiodiversity produces standardized crops for which a certain quality and quantity of the yield can be guaranteed. Easy mechanization of crop fields that makes their farming more cost effective and guarantees a certain level of production, but only if environmental conditions are optimal. On the other hand, Reducing biodiversity makes the crops more susceptible to pathogen invasions than all other kinds of environmental changes that can cause unpredicted catastrophic losses of the yields. It further reduces ecosystem services such as crop pollination and causes an overall loss of biodiversity, which is one of the largest ecological issues of modern humanity.